media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, recycling trade publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is market historian Bob Hoy. He's the chief investment strategist for ChartsAndMarkets.com. Welcome back to the show, Bob. Yeah, hi, Jim. Here we are. It's our Friday morning together, and... uh... The sun's shining in Vancouver, and it's all, but it's not shining on all of the financial markets today. Uh, Toronto's down, a uh, mixed day in New York. The oil companies, though, Bob, have done tremendously well. They're uh, a wash in cash. In fact, uh, I have a, a question right off the top. Chevron, I believe, is has a $10 billion share buyback plan over the next two years they have so much cash on hand yet the international energy agency says not enough is being invested in oil and gas exploration why don't they keep some of that cash to ensure future oil supplies or are they looking forward to 100 to 200 dollar a barrel oil because supplies are short well uh yeah i saw the headline that one of the majors was going to set aside billions of dollars to buy their stock which is i I am much opposed uh, as a financial historian against uh, stock buybacks. It's artificial and stupid, and it may not work in the longer run. Uh, as to building cash, uh, hey, you've had tremendous price increase since Biden moved to, sh- to try and shut down as much of American oil and gas production as he could, you know, on federal lands. So you've got this uh, rise in prices, so the oil companies are making money. Uh, that's all right. I have no problem with that. Now, also, they may be seeing in different geographic regions uh, risk. I mean, why, it, it, why would you go and expand your exposure in a country where the federal government hates oil and gas? But I don't think this will last too long. The uh, rise in natural gas prices became technically overdone. And then as of uh, today, we're working on a study on uh, on crude oil. And I can say that it's overdone as well. So uh, a correction in these prices uh, seems probable. We have a number of listener questions for us today, Bob. The first one comes from Kathleen, and I haven't looked at the question yet, but I bet you there's a musical reference in it, because she loves to bring in this. Okay, maybe there isn't. Anyway, from Kathleen, hi, Bob and Jim, happy Halloween. Will the ghosts of November haunt the markets this year, or do the ghosts of the Black Monday flash crash on that frightful October 19th, 1987 revisit us again? Some bears have seen apparitions. Maybe I should be doing this like Count Dracula. I've seen apparitions that fast appeared on Black <laughs> Tuesday, October 24, 1929. And others claim to see witches on broomsticks resembling black swans circling the markets from above. Bob, can the Fed fight off the hobgoblins, the short sellers, and the margin clerks yet again this ghostly season? Kathleen, very well phrased question, and Jim, an amusing delivery. Oh, uh, the the ideal time uh, in a speculative market for a uh, discovery of problems is usually in the September October period, and so there was a modest correction, but this was. Uh, a f- more severe correction was staved off by the fact that you had suddenly hot 
commodities, uh, lithium, aluminum, natural gas, crude oil, and which these days is taken as a plus for the stock market. So, and this was, we noted in early September that the, that the, in commodities, it could be yet another rotation into commodities. So you had the first rotation up until about May, and then a correction, and then, a, and then recently a new set of players, which was positive. But now, in the last couple of weeks, first of all, but nat- natural gas uh, reach speculative excesses. Then aluminum, and then as of today, uh, crude oil. So it looks like the the set of hot commodities now have perhaps done their best and head down. And uh, Kathleen put it didn't put any songs in this question, but. She's got broomsticks and witches and black swans, but uh, I think black swans uh, is uh, denotes that uh, it's an exceptional uh, decline or setback or disaster. But in the financial markets, uh, major uh, setbacks follow great, great financial bubbles. So, so there is no uh, element of uh, of uh, like a black swan, there's been five previous great financial bubbles since the first in 1720, and their climaxes have all been similar, and then they've all suffered uh, severe hits. Uh, the uh, and often in the October period with bottoming in November, but this one, you know, this one's got stretched out, as I said, because you had a sudden wave of straight up stuff for, uh, lithium and crude oil and natural gas, which is, which could be, uh, ending here. So, yeah, the financial markets are, uh, vulnerable to their own excesses, and what we want to do is look at which groups are being excessive? Well, or the most reckless? Well, you've got the bulls, uh, and a bunch of new ones out there. There are new people in the stock markets, uh, who have never been in them before. And with a rising market, they've suddenly become experts and know what's going to happen. And then the other set of reckless speculators, of course, are the, uh, central bankers who think that they can manage the economy, and uh, so they're shifting all over the place. After spending a decade of easy money, because as they stated, there wasn't enough inflation, so they were providing easy credit in a time when a financial bubble was on, and the last time they did this was in 1920s, when they looked and said, oh, there's not enough inflation, we've got to ease credit, and not understanding that the action was going into stocks and bonds, and then when they crash, then you do get uh, a a serious contraction. So that's the same thing. The, uh, the, the, The central bank appears to have a lot of power, and the street really believes that as lender of last resort, it can prevent the crisis, the financial crisis that uh, is followed by a recession. Well, there's been 18 cyclical recessions since the Fed was formed in 1913, so the theory doesn't work. And then what happens then is even the, if the short sellers are always out there, and if they're too early, they get squeezed and add to the bids on the way up, which removes bids on the way down, and then but I'm I'm betting the same thing, and, and Kathleen, you were right to put in that the margin clerks are out there. Their job is to get the accounts, the leveraged accounts in line, and these days central banking has been corrupted into getting all of the accounts highly leveraged in the stock market, and that is, uh, that's a very bad policy, and thanks for the question. From Michael, 
Hi, Jim and Bob. It seems like everyone is predicting the big seasonal rally to all-time highs into next year. Many analysts say that a 10% rally or more is in the cards, or maybe the fortune teller's cards, with the S&P at 5,000 by year end. However, it seems like many markets have double-topped with some exhibiting very weak or unconfirmed breakouts this week. Bob, are current year-end rally predictions really in the cards, or will this be more like the November 2018 surprise sell-off? Do you see a sell-off into December following that final spike high in the first quarter of 2022? Also, is it a good time to short the very extended oil and gas markets? From your friend, Michael. Yeah, Michael, thanks for the question. Good analysis also on on your review of the markets. Uh, one is tempted to consider the possibility of a rally into year-end, like January, and we have used that in previous years, but not now. Also, uh, through late summer, I was expecting more of a correction in the correction period into September and October, but in discussing the previous question, we noted that the uh, the sudden uh, eruption of, of straight-up commodities, particularly for the energy, gold or crude oil and that gas, provided tremendous support for the stock markets. But the action in oil and gas, and this was the last part of your question, is uh, is extremely hot. And the, as it goes back a couple of weeks where we got the upside, uh, all of the excesses on that gas, and it has been correcting and with a rebound. But, uh, and then as of, uh, well, today we haven't even put the study out yet. Uh, we're getting technical excesses on, on crude oil itself. Now with these measuring technical excesses, you're never sure whether it's like right now or the action could continue for a week or so, so more. And this is where I think uh, uh, more detailed work, which we do, and one can get in touch with Ross on this, who is uh, very good on some of the near-term moves. So, yeah, uh, right questions, and the last part is is to the point. And uh, I think now, overall, once this action in crude oil rolls over, uh, I think you can get a, a more broader correction uh, setback in the stock markets. Now, as to actually call the top, that's very elusive. And we've had a line in the sand, which is one of our uh, trading tools. It's called a uh, the um, it gives us buying the dips on on a setback and. Uh, the um, the irony is that this tool is designed to work in flat to rising markets, and you can never tell which uh, yeah springboard buy is the last one in the bull market until it's taken out. So for us, the line in the sand has always been taking out the last springboard buy which was a number of weeks ago. So uh, this is intellectual conversation, and we'll be watching it. And uh, But uh, there's no question that the markets are at risk and vulnerable to, I think, uh, the oil and gas sector rolling over. And uh, that, you can't tell which week it's going to happen, but we do know that the, the excesses are in right now. So... Very interesting times. Our uh, third question comes from Lesko. He writes, Hi, Bob and Jim. Love your show. With the Bank of Canada ending quantitative easing November 1st, what do you see ahead for the Canadian real estate market? Oh, yeah. I think the Canadian real estate market it has more to do with the Asian buyer than anything the Bank of Canada has been doing. Of course, the Bank of Canada 
as with all other central bankers, they have learned only one thing, and that uh, currency depreciation is is the is the policy, and they never ever quit it. But then there are times when forces of contraction have overwhelmed the uh, ability of central bankers to both uh, to keep the party going. So uh, that the central bank Canada is discussing ending quantitative easing, I take it as discussion. Now, those guys can turn on a dime. They see a little bit of fright in the market, and they'll be back to pumping the uh, pumping the pump. And uh, but I don't think once this market really breaks, uh, there's no easing by central bankers that will uh, be able to restore the party. But be very clear about this: is that the market really needs to take a severe break to end the long bull market, and once it does that then there's nothing the central banks can do about it. So we watch for that moment. And again, the line in the sand we've been using is when it takes out the last springboard by. So we'll be watching for it. We'll have more with Bob Hoy right after this. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Bob Hoy. Bob, some of the headlines that caught your attention today. Commercial real estate sales and values surge to record highs. Yeah, that was in the U.S., and uh, that's what's happening. Uh, You can have a hot real estate market. Um, particularly on residential in a, the final stages of a great, fabulous, uh, financial bubble. And this is what we're having. And so you're getting this mix of headlines where you've got boom type headlines at the same time as you've got headlines that are recording some of the, uh, contraction features that always follow a great financial mania. Now, friend of the show, Jordan Bateman, the vice president of marketing for the Independent Contractors and Business Association in BC, in uh, his show on the Goddard Report this week, he pointed out one of the reasons why commercial real estate I- is booming is the shortage of warehouse space as manufacturers and other companies have learned that relying on just in time doesn't work anymore. And so they don't want to get caught flat again. So they're trying to buy up warehouse space near all the ports. And that's happening right here in Vancouver. And he said, uh, industrial land here in Vancouver is, uh, twice, or, well, it's about $15.50 a square foot. In Toronto and Calgary, it's $10. So that's one of the driving forces behind oh, this. Oh, that up. makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Oh, that's a very good comment. And, uh, yeah, because one of the things when, uh, uh, real long interest rates went up in the early 80s is that's then when everybody shifted to, uh, keep, uh, to, uh, uh, very tight inventories. And, uh, the same thing happened in, uh, in, in the 1920s. And, and the, the, uh, the, the phrase then, Jim, was keep your shelves as bare as you dare. And working on a high turnover and delivery just in time. But of course now, with uh, this problem in shipping, which is complex and also uh, partly caused by government shutting everything down and California with all kinds of incredibly complex rules that keep private truckers out of the game, that sort of thing. So a lot of part of the uh, sh- the backup of shipping is policy derived. But this view uh, that it's prompting now uh, a turn by businesses to have make sure they've got enough supplies on hand so they're building the cushion and yeah it's a that's a very good point I'm, i i hadn't run into it before headline tesla is the first junk bond rated company to get one trillion dollars in market cap yeah to get a company up to a trillion dollar market cap 
I've been in the business for a long time, and this is an extraordinary number. Of course, you, I mean, Apple and whatnot, they're maybe two and a half or three trillion, but nonetheless. But when Tesla's case, because the company really doesn't make any money, uh, they don't sell a huge number of cars compared to, say, Toyota or General Motors or Volkswagen or Fiat. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's been a remarkably successful promotion. And, and, uh, Tesla is one of the greatest stock promotions in history. And that by this measure, it is, uh, it's astounding to have a company with a trillion dollar market cap and their bonds are rated as junk. And, uh, will be interesting to watch this one. I've never tried to trade it because the whole thing is just so crazy, but, uh, it, it, it will fail at some time. Uh, again, uh, one doesn't know when, but, uh, it'll be fascinating when it does. Headline. Bondholders risk $2.6 trillion hit even with the slightest increase in interest rates. What's the story there, yeah, Bob? That's the old one, Jim, about was bond prices go up, yields go down. And they, uh, it's been a long and fabulous bull market for uh, high-grade bonds and even lately very exciting for junk bonds. And all the writers doing it with that headline is pointing out that with the uh, so many uh, trillions of dollars of bonds outstanding, all it'll take is a slight uptick in yield and a downtick in price to mark down the value of portfolios in a huge amount. So, again, these kind of numbers confirm that the big, really big action has been in financial assets, stocks and bonds, and the story now about old-fashioned 1970s inflation coming back is generally uh, promoted by those who haven't read enough financial history. So I'm staying on the inflation story is that the inflation in financial assets has been the big game. And uh, actually, that's confirmed by uh, the Federal Reserve, who for the last decade felt that it, there wasn't enough inflation. So they pumped up uh, the credit and it went into stocks. And, of course, that was the same thing as in the 1920s. They were horrified by the prospect of deflation and poured huge amounts of credit into the market. So then we get to the issue at hand, which is when this financial mania finally completes with all sectors having been pushed to crazy levels, and then the first major crack. And uh, But uh, with the action, recent action in hot commodities becoming so hot that they're set up now for a correction, I think we're going to see... Uh, quite a, a, a more extensive correction in the stock market. Again, can't tell whether it's going to be, begin yesterday, tomorrow, or Monday, or next week, but uh, it's primed for a uh, significant correction. Headline, China falling home prices cost, cause another uh, shadow over their economy. Yeah. I saw one the other day where uh, a decade ago, a huge complex of apartment towers had been built, but not quite finished. So they stood empty for a decade, and then, of course, deterioration was something awful. So without anybody ever moving into them, <laughs> they demolished them with all kinds of wonderful uh dynamite and explosives and stuff they all collapse so and then you've got the connection danielle who is saying that there's something like 150 million empty apartments in china so uh, 190 190 it was eh? 190 yeah. million well yeah. even uh cmhc says in canada we've got 1.3 vacant homes but i i don't think we're in the same situation as oh, china no uh 
probably overbuilt, but nothing uh, as speculative as in uh, in in China. This is this has been remarkable, where they have built built empty cities and have built incredible communications with roads and highways and train rails and stuff like that to connect empty cities and uh, we'll see how that one goes but uh, I was quite fascinated to see that little video about uh, where apartments uh, on the boom of 10 years ago weren't completed deteriorated and you had maybe four or five apartment towers I mean these things look like at least 40 stories high were, were demolished just like that so, uh, well, also, uh, fascinating. Something, right. And, uh, China's, uh, one child policy has come back to bite them. They will, in the next few years, have a declining population. And, yep. of course, they'll have an incredibly large number of old people like us, Bob. Yeah. Going to be very interesting. All the markets, all the stories, all the rescues that the central bankers are going to do. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it, Jim. Bob, thank you so much for chatting with us. Yeah, good to be with you, and we're looking forward to next week. My guest has been market historian Bob Hoy. He's the chief investment strategist for chartsandmarkets.com. Your questions for Bob can be sent to info at howstreet.com. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Find us on Twitter at House Street. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.